this evening we're uh, looking at, um, uh, well, uh, truths that are in Colossians. And so I'd ask you, if you want to follow along, to turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and uh, our text is uh, verses 5 through 11, but I'm going to read from verse 1 to get a bit of context. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Would you listen carefully to this? This is the word of God. Paul writes, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge. According to the image of the one who created him a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. May the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, we were already reminded that last week uh, we saw the command that uh, Paul gave us. We saw it again this evening in our meditation We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and we are to make no provision, make no room for our flesh. We saw specifically with regard to its lust. God wants us to take care of our bodies, Uh, not to overdo it, of course, but to take good care of them. But what he is referring to here is the flesh in the sense of it being sin. We are to make no provision for it, to allow it to express itself in our lives. Obedience is to be universal. It is to be across the board. We are to do all that the Lord calls us to do. And so your fight against sin is also to be universal. This is what the Lord commands. This is your duty. And thankfully, it's also possible because the Lord has given you his spirit. Without his spirit, it would be impossible. Now, this evening, we're going to continue the theme of putting off all sin. I'm sure you understand that by now. And we we do see that principle, again, shot throughout Scripture. We find it in our passage, particularly in verse 8, where Paul writes, But now you also put them all aside. The same thing when he says in verse 5, Therefore, consider the members of your body as dead. And even though he indicates particulars, He does have in mind all sin. Now the question we want to ask this evening is why? Why all sin? Why must it be all or nothing? Well, Paul actually gives us several reasons in our text, and certainly there are many more in Scripture. So we're going to look at those here, and we're going to add a couple of more. And basically, if you have that outline in front of you, you can see what they are. But let me just read them off as to why you should put off all sin. First of all, because sin is idolatry. Secondly, because it brings God's wrath. Thirdly, because it steals precious time. Fourthly, because in Christ you have put off the old self and have put on the new. Fifthly, because if you are ever going to overcome any one sin, you have to fight against all of them. Sixthly, because... You really don't want to put off any sin unless you want to do the same for all of your sins. Um, And lastly, because of what it costs Jesus 
to forgive you and to free you from your sin. Now, those last three don't come from this text, but they are important reasons why we should fight against all of them. Now, there are seven. Now, don't get worried that this is going to be a really lengthy sermon. Because there are seven, I'm going to deal with each of them briefly, but I hope enough for us to be able to understand them. First of all, you should put off every sin because sin is idolatry. Paul writes in verse 5, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now certainly it's possible that Paul is singling out um, uh, greed, uh, covetousness, and so forth. It is likened in Scripture to idolatry. Because of one's desire for something, it elevates that thing that you want or that you're coveting above God. That was the sin, as a matter of fact, of the rich young ruler. Uh, his possessions were his idol, and he loved them more than he loved God. But it's also true that sin, all sin, is idolatry. Because whenever you submit to any one sin, you're actually elevating that sin and your obedience to it above your obedience to God. You're actually showing that your desire for that thing, whatever it may be, for that particular act or that particular object which God does not want you to do or to have, your desire for that is stronger than your desire for God, which means your love for that thing is greater than your love for God, which means you are making that thing your God, handing over to that object the ability to command you. And in doing so, you're breaking the first commandment. And of course, in breaking the first commandment, as we've already heard, you break any one of them, you break them all. You know, we live in a uh, materialistic society where we elevate things regularly above God. We can love our house, we can love our car, we can love our work, our position, we can love our spouse, we can love sports, we can love all these things more than we love God so easily. Now for Christians, of course, we'll be tempted to do that, but we can't do that fully because the Spirit of God is working in our hearts. But we need to realize the temptation is there and fight against it. Every sin usurps the place that God alone should hold in your heart. And so if it's fighting for your affections for God, it has to go. And so you need to put it off. You need to put off every sin. God must be God in your life and not sin be God in your life. Now, secondly, you should put off every sin because sin brings God's wrath. Notice what Paul says in verse 6. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Now, the Westminster Assembly reminds us in the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 15, section 4, what every sin deserves, every sin, no matter how great, no matter how small, but for God's grace. It says there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. Every sin deserves damnation. And what is damnation except God's wrath against sin? God hates sin. Now, this is what your sin and my sin would deserve, and this is what we would have received except for what Jesus Christ has done. If Jesus had not died for our sins, damnation, God's wrath, is what we would get for our sins, for every single sin, and every sin that we commit, since we've already you know, came into the world sinful and have committed many more, only adds to God's wrath against us. The Bible says that God pours his wrath out every single day against sin. That that's why he's coming again one day, why our Lord Jesus Christ is going to return, is to judge all men for their sins to see what degree of wrath they actually deserve to measure it out, as it were, against them. That's why the Lord, when he comes back, is going to renovate the universe. He's going to bring in a new heavens and a new earth because sin has polluted his creation. And so he's going to purge it. 
Well, the point is that God hates sin. He hates all sin, every sin. God must judge every sin. And he must consign those who practice sin to everlasting damnation. Now, if this is what God thinks of sin, if this is how he views sin, if this is what sin deserves from his hand, then can you so easily allow yourself to sin? Can you allow any sin in your life? Well, certainly not if you have any respect for the Lord. If there is any godly fear in your heart of the Lord, you have to stay away from the things that he hates. You have to stay away from everything that he hates that brings down his wrath and condemnation. If you fear the Lord at all, how can you do otherwise except put off every sin and make no room in it for your life or in your life for it? Now, thirdly, you should put off every sin because of what sin has taken from you. I hope you realize there is a cost to sin. Paul reminds these readers in verse 7, and in them, that is in these sinful activities, you also once walked when you were living in them. Your sins are not only infinitely offensive to God, but any part of your life that you have given to sin is time that you have lost forever and that you cannot reclaim, time that you cannot or will not be rewarded for. We talk about the fact that um, really our whole lives are to be a continual offering, a sacrifice to God, an act of worship to Him. We are to do everything we do for the glory of God. Well, any time that you give to sin, and by the way, you're only giving your time to one or the other. You're either giving your time to sin or you're giving your time to the Lord. There really isn't an in-between as far as I can see. You're either honoring and glorifying Him and doing the things He wants you to do, or you're not doing the things He wants you to do. Or maybe you're doing those things, but not for His glory or not for His honor. Either way, what we do falls into one of two categories. And what you do for God will be rewarded. And what you do that is sinful for self or things you ought not to be doing is time that you are eliminating, you are getting rid of, even though you're forgiven. When you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have still taken that time and thrown it away. Now, the question you need to ask yourself is how much of your life do you want to pour down that drain and get rid of? Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Sadly, all of us have taken a portion of our lives and we have poured it away. We have put it down the drain. It, it would have destroyed us ultimately if we had not trusted in Jesus, but now it's a big hole in our lives. God certainly may have worked it together for some good and he says that he will do that and we can use those things perhaps to redeem the time that we have remaining but you're not going to be rewarded for that time you spent in sin and you don't want to continue to give your life and your time to sin. Every moment of time that you have remaining to you is an infinitely precious gift from God. It's really the only space in which you will have the opportunity to serve the Lord in this world and gain rewards for it. And, of course, honor the Lord in it. You only have so much of this time, and you really don't know how much of that time you have. And as Edwards once pointed out, once your time is gone, once the last moment of your life has elapsed, all the wealth of the universe cannot purchase back for you even one moment. So seeing that you have this limited quantity of time in which to serve the Lord, don't let sin steal any more of your life Put it off. 
put all sin off and redeem the time. So don't let sin steal your opportunities. Put it all off. Fourthly, you should put off every sin because you have, in fact, in the Lord Jesus Christ, laid aside the old self and have put on the new. That's the reason why that Paul gives in verses 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Now when you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you look to him alone to save you, we've already saw this, I believe, at the beginning. As a matter of fact, uh, it was one of the texts that we looked at right here in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. But when you trusted in Jesus Christ, you were united to Jesus Christ. You were buried with him. You know how Jesus is our substitute. We call him our vicar in a good sense. I mean, he is the true vicar of God. It's not the pope. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, as our substitute, took our place in everything that he did in this world, in his obedience, in his death, also in his burial and in his resurrection. Those things that Jesus did, he did for everyone who will put their trust in him. So the moment that you actually believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're united with him, you were buried with him and you were raised with him. Your old self died when you trusted in Jesus, and a new creature was born. Now, since your old man is dead, the Lord calls you to lay aside that which was a part of the old man, and that is the way you used to live, the things that you wanted to do before coming to Christ, the things that your flesh, uh, at least the sinful nature, the corruption in your heart wanted. You're to lay that aside, lay aside all of those things because the old man is dead. And since you are a new creature, he says, put on the works of that new man. Love righteousness and hate sin. This is in fact what you actually want to do because of the Holy Spirit living within you. And so what Paul is saying here is yield to this new nature, to this new desire, to the Spirit of God and Cross the will of the old man. It has been buried. It has been put to death. Sadly, though, it is still active in our hearts. It is that sinful nature. It's still going to be erupting in our hearts and moving us to do things. But we are to put those things off. We are to set our hearts on putting those things to death because we are, in fact, new creatures in Christ. And so put off every sin the whole old man, not just parts of him. Now, fifthly, here's where we move into other reasons that are important as to why it's necessary that we put every sin off, that we fight against every sin, and not just a few of them. Fifth, you should put off every sin because if you don't, you're really not going to be able to overcome any sin. You know, this has to do with that relationship between the fruits and the roots that we looked at uh, last week. You really can't put off any one sin unless you put off every sin. Because again, of this relationship of the fruit to the root. Love is really at the root of everything that we do that is right. Sin is at the root of everything that we do that is wrong. Anything we do in our life that strengthens sin is going to strengthen every sin because when we sin, it strengthens the roots of all the fruits of sin. That's why it's futile to try to knock the fruits of sin or to deal with just individual fruits. You, know, you can't kill the tree by knocking the fruit off the tree. Even if you could knock all the fruit off the tree, the tree is still going to stand. It's still going to uh, put out more fruit because you haven't attacked the root. And that's what happens when you fight against one sin, but you practice other sins. By practicing those other sins, you're strengthening that principle of sin in your heart. And that principle of sin is giving strength to all sin in your life. So you're fighting against one, but you're 
actually strengthening that one by giving in to the others. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're trying to overcome lust in your life, but you don't fight against the other sins. You, you allow yourself to break your vows. You don't mind breaking the Sabbath. You dishonor and disobey authority. You hate others rather than loving others. You covet what other people have and so forth. You allow yourself to practice these other sins while you try to go against just the one sin. Well, how can you hope to overcome your lust when you're feeding it at the same time by indulging the other desires of the flesh? You're actually strengthening your lust at the same time. If you give in to any one sin, you actually strengthen the whole. You're strengthening, as it were, the root or the foundation of sin. So you must fight against every sin. If you would overcome any one sin, you have to fight against all sin. In other words, you have to fight against sin or that corruption in your heart as a whole in every area that it expresses itself. Now, sixthly, and this is another important reason that kind of goes along with the last. You should seek to put off every sin because you really don't want to defeat or to put off that one sin unless you're wanting to put off every sin. And again, I think we talked about this a little bit last week. Now, if you think you're fighting against lust because it's sin and because you hate sin, because it's sinful in God's eyes, but you're not fighting against the other sins. You need to realize that you're fighting against lust for some other reason than that it is sin. Because if you hated lust because it's sin, you would hate and fight against every sin. I hope that makes sense. I think that's really quite an important point, and again, one that Edwards has uh, brought out in, in his works. If you love any one sin, if you hold on to any one sin knowing that it is sin, then you do not hate sin. You can't hate sin and love sin at the same time, you see. The sin that you're actually trying to put off, you would be putting off for some other reason than that it is sin if you're actually practicing some other sin and loving some other sin. I mean, there are other reasons why people put sins off. Besides the fact that they hate sin, they might try to get rid of a particular sin because of what it's costing them with regard to their reputation. I mean, someone might, um, well, might resist the temptation to fall into adultery because it might cost him his job or it might cost him his position in government. Someone might resist gambling because it's, it's ruining them financially and destroying their family. There are a lot of reasons why people may give up individual sins. But if you're going to give it up and fight against it because it is sin, then the same thing will be true of every sin. You will have to put them all off if you're going to fight against any one. You really can't hate it as sin if you're only fighting one but not fighting all. You will put them all off because as a Christian you hate all of them. So again, the reason why to put it all off or to put off your sins is because they are all hateful to God. You hate them all because of the new principle within you. You will put them all off. And now I save the, what I consider to be the best reason for last. And one, of course, that points us to the table. Why should you fight against every sin? Why should you try to put every sin off? Well, for the reasons we've already seen, but particularly this one. Because of what it cost Jesus Christ to forgive you of these sins and to free you from the power of sin. I mean, what did it cost him? It cost him his life. Now, if you really love Jesus Christ, you should want nothing to do with the reason why he was nailed to the cross. Now, we saw this morning what Jesus Christ actually went through in order to free you. I mean, he was betrayed by Judas into the hands of the chief priests and scribes who put him on trial and condemned him to death. They handed him over to the Romans for crucifixion. Of course, before that, several things took place. Pilate actually took Jesus and Barabbas and offered to release one of them. 
And the Jews cried out, give us Barabbas, give us the insurrectionist, give us the murderer, but don't give us Jesus Christ. He was turned down for a murderer. And then Pilate hands him over to be scourged. And of course, before that happens, he's mocked, he's spit upon, uh, he's beaten. And of course, scourging, as you know, is not a pleasant thing to go through where they take a whip and they whip your back. And after that, he was crucified. Now, all of that was nothing compared to what he actually endured on the cross when God the Father poured out his wrath upon Jesus Christ for every sin that he bore. And why did the Father give his son to do this? And why did Jesus Christ go through this? It was because of sin, but not just any sin. It was for your sin that he did that if you are trusting him this evening. Now, you may not think sin is such a serious thing, but that's obviously not the way that God views it. Some think that sin or that it should be really easy for God to forgive sin, that he can just say, oh, well, I forgive you, you know, in a, in a way that, that we can sometimes do. Somebody offends us and we say, well, I forgive you. But you gotta realize that if their sin injured you in some way, the only reason why you're able to forgive them is, and if they're a Christian, is because Jesus Christ paid for their sin. That's the grounds upon which you can forgive them. And if somebody who is not a Christian sins against you and he asks for forgiveness, well, you may be able to forgive them, but they're still going to have to pay for that sin. They're going to have to pay for it in hell forever unless they repent and trust in Jesus Christ. But the point is there is always a payment for sin. Now, God, in order to forgive sin, had to make a great payment. In order to forgive you, he had to pay the life of his only begotten son. He had to make Jesus Christ suffer, not just for one sin, but for every single one of your sins. Now realizing that it was your sin that nailed Christ to the cross, can you so easily allow yourself in sin, knowing what it cost him? It cost Jesus his life not only to, for, to forgive you of your sins, but also to free you from the power of sin, to break the chains, as it were, that held you. you know, fast bound in sin and nature's night, as Charles Wesley says in his hymn, And Can It Be? Now, if it cost him his life to free you, will you so easily submit to sin again and become its slave? Sin is something you should never submit to. It is something that should not be an option. I think one of the most poignant ways it was put was a Puritan pastor. I looked for the quote. I know I read it, but I couldn't find the particular one who said this, and perhaps one of them said it, and then others grabbed onto it over the years. But he said this, it would be better for you to throw yourself into hell than to allow yourself to commit one sin. I know that sounds rather radical. Let me explain what he meant by that. What he meant was this. It's better for you to enter into hell and to suffer the pain of hell and not deserve it than it would be to commit an infinite offense against God and deserve to suffer in hell. I hope you see the difference. One is a physical evil, the pain, the suffering that you might endure, but you don't deserve it versus committing an act that would actually make you deserve that. We don't often make that kind of comparison, but I think it is a legitimate one. It would be better for you to enter into hell and to suffer, even though you don't deserve it, than to commit a sin against the infinitely holy God and deserve that suffering. Now, is that how you see sin? I wonder if, if any of us really looks at it in those terms. If it is, then don't do it. If it isn't, then perhaps you don't understand just how evil sin is. We all need to, to come to a better understanding of it because sin is infinitely offensive to God. And the way that we know that it is is by looking at the price that he paid to free you from it. It cost him his son, one who is infinitely precious. 
Now again, even if we, let's say, we, we accept this and we, we understand that this is what has to be done and we set our hearts to fight against sin, we, we understand at the same time that you and I are not going to be able completely to subdue sin in our lives. There's always going to be something in our hearts of self-love in the things we do, pride, the desire that others see what we're doing and applaud us for them, for those things. But still, we are to do, by God's grace, the very best that we possibly can do to keep our minds pure, to keep our motives pure, and to keep our actions pure, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for our flesh with regard to its lusts. I hope that some of these reasons resonate with you, that, that they, they make sense, and that you can see, again, because of the evil nature of sin, just because of the reasonableness of what he calls us to do, you can't overcome one. You can't just hate one. You've got to hate them all. You can't just overcome one. You have to fight against them all. All these things are true. And this is what the Lord calls us to do. This is how not only will you honor him, but you will also do yourself a great deal of good, redeeming the time, using your life in a significant way. I mean, let's face it. Time runs out. Someday it's, it's all going to be gone. And if we keep spending time, even if we are believers, even if our sins have been forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we keep dabbling in things that the Lord hates, at the very best, we're going to take our life and flush it down the drain. Sin will rob you of so much. It is dishonoring to God. We must fight against every sin. It's idolatry. We must love the Lord more. So may the Lord help us all. May he encourage us through, through, of course, his word, what we've just seen, as well as by his Holy Spirit. And may we also encourage one another. The Lord has given us uh, one another in our fellowship also to exhort one another to love and good deeds that we might put off our sins and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So may he help us not to allow any sin in our lives. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.